We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelson. Welcome to the show. Today we're going to replace an outdated kitchen faucet with one that looks terrific and works great. It's a project that you can absolutely do yourself. Then we'll add some colored panels to the back of a bookcase, creating a color accent that's warm and welcoming. Next, we'll see how to tackle those larger or unusual clamping jobs. And finally, we'll see exactly how to replace a thermostat with absolutely no hassles or guesswork. Well, this is going to be a short crosstown trip. I'm going to be visiting a friend of mine right here in Fairfield, Connecticut, Peter Featherston. Hey, Peter. Hey, Ron. How you doing? Buddy? Very good. So you want some help with a faucet? I sure do. All right. Well, you lend me a hand with the windows. It's your turn, man. Well, let's go. So that's it, huh? That's it. Yeah, it works. Yeah, it does work, but uh, I'd like to give Christine a new one. Why? Well, we're going to redo the kitchen soon, and uh, I'd like to start with the faucet. Ah, uh, okay. It's so something this, I can do. So this is kind of a preview of the kitchen remodel. You're going you're gonna to give her this as a token of what's to come? Yeah, I'd like to surprise her with it, All yes. Right. All okay. right. All right. I can help you with that. Uh, you know, there's only going to be room for one of us in here, so um, if you've got something you want to do, just go ahead. I and sure do. I'll, I'll give you a holler if I need some help. I'll probably have to have you show me where to turn off the water for the house if it comes to that. Okay. All right. I'll be there. All right, Peter. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> well, this is my first surprise of the day. Normally, there would be shutoff valves right here so that I could turn off the water supply for the sink while I'm installing the new faucet. Since there are none, I'm probably going to have to turn off the water for the entire house. Down in the basement, I discover shutoff valves for the first floor. By opening the faucet, I bleed off any remaining water pressure. I'm going to remove the sink drain, starting with the dishwasher hose. Now, I don't absolutely have to disconnect the drain, but doing so will give me a lot more room to work and easier access. The PVC plastic pipe is simple to take out and will be just as easy to put back. Next, I cut the copper water lines where they come out of the wall so that I can detach the lines from the faucet. Here, too, is where I'll install the shutoff valves so that from now on, the sink water supply can be turned off without affecting the rest of the house. Okay. My next step is to unscrew those water lines that I just cut from the faucet. And that's where I find this tool to be indispensable. It's called a basin wrench, and it's designed really just for this purpose, to reach up behind the sink to grab that nut in these jaws right here and allow me to loosen it. I'll show you what I mean. Now you can see how impossible it would be to get a conventional wrench in here. I use the tool in a sort of ratcheting motion, backing off the nut a fraction of a turn at a time until I can remove it with my fingers. I use this same tool to loosen the retaining nuts holding the faucet base to the sink. Finally, with everything free, I can lift out the old faucet. Underneath is quite a bit of dried plumber's putty, which cleans up fairly easily with a plastic putty knife. I want to avoid scratching the sink. And a cloth or plastic scrub pad. Well, I've gotten all of the old out. Now I'm going to start putting the new in, beginning with the shutoff valves down below. I just slip the valves on the copper pipe 
and tighten the compression fittings using two wrenches. This keeps the valve from spinning and avoids twisting the pipe. The first step in installing the new fixture is to place a rubber O-ring on the faucet base. Then insert the lower end of the faucet through the sinkhole. Underneath, I slip on a mounting plate and washer, followed by a retaining nut. This plastic socket wrench comes with the fixture. To get the leverage I need, I insert a screwdriver to use as a handle. Next, I insert the spray nozzle hose into the end of the faucet, push it all the way through, and out the bottom. This faucet has individual valves for hot and cold water. Plumber's putty will make a watertight seal at the valve base, preventing water from dripping into the cabinet below. I'm ready to put in the valves. Now, if this sink weren't already installed on the countertop, I could do this myself. But because it is already in place, I'm going to need some help. All right, so just uh, go underneath and shove this up through the hole there for the valve, would you? It will do. Yeah, and I'll get it when it comes through the top here. Great. Hold it there. Okay, push it, pull it down. Okay, now hand tighten those nuts. Once Peter gets the nuts snugged up, I tighten them with the basin wrench. This is a two-valve faucet. When the valves are open, cold water flows through one and hot through the other. Tubes connect the valves to the faucet hose, where the hot and cold water are blended together and stream out through the nozzle. On this faucet, the hoses connecting the faucet to the valves have clips that slip on and snap in place. Next, I connect the water supply lines. First to the faucet, I'm using that basin wrench again. And then to the new shutoff valves. Then I place the valve handles and trim on top of the valve body and screw them in place. I drop the pump housing for the liquid soap dispenser in place and secure it from the bottom with a retaining nut. The pump itself just sits on top so it can be lifted out for refilling. With all the water supply lines connected, I can begin replacing the drain. Reinstalling this P-trap is about the last thing I'm going to have to do before I test for leaks. Now if the drain fittings had been old or worn, I would have taken this opportunity to replace them. These though are in good shape, so I'll just reattach them and reconnect the dishwasher hose. Well, everything's done, so I can turn on the water and see if I've got any leaks. Well, I don't see or hear anything, but here's my litmus test for leaks. I put some paper towels on the bottom of the cabinet and wait a few minutes, come back and take a look. If there are any drips, they'll show up right here. So far, so good. And here comes Mom. You ready? One, right. two, three! Surprise! Hi! Hey, this it's is great! Nice. Hey, this is great! I love it! What do you think, Alex? You know what you can do with this? You can pull this down hey and point it at your brother and have okay. great water okay. fights. Okay. And it looks like a new sink. This is wonderful! Yeah. In fact, you know, I, I was saying to Peter, I don't even know if you really need the remodel now that you got right. this. Yeah, that's a nice try. We're getting the remodel. <laughs> <laughs> Should we have a toast? Sure! Oh, why don't you turn it on? 
Hey, Oliver, you want toast? <laughs> okay, you here you go, Oliver. Turn it on. Okay, and turn it off. Cheers to your help. Thank well you, Well done. This was terrific. I recently finished building my bookcase here, and when I painted the back, well, I made it the same color as the front and the sides, which is what I normally do. But my wife, Lynn, was looking through a magazine, and she saw a bookcase very similar to this, with the back painted an accent color. And we thought, you know what? That could look really good in this room. Lynn and I love this lamp, and we love this color green. We thought it would look great, possibly, as an accent color on the bookcase. The question was, though, what shade of green? Well, there's plenty of natural green around this part of the country for inspiration, and I get to take it in every time I head over to the Home Improvement Center. With all the foliage fresh in my mind, I start looking through the paint chips and decide to pick three slightly different shades of green, with the thought that one of them will be just what we're looking for. A quarter of each will let me do a test before I commit to a color. Back at the shop, I paint three sample panels, let them dry, then take them inside. Now, I'll admit, I'm a bit challenged when it comes to visualizing colors from a small chip. Making larger samples like this really helps, and it also lets me see the colors under different lighting conditions. So these are the three colors I picked out. What do you think? Um, I think they're all pretty. I think I definitely have a preference though for the middle one. I think this one over here, it's a little too strong, and when it gets dim out, it may actually look a little too dark. And that one looks a little too pale to me, doesn't really have enough contrast. You took the words right out of my mouth, you know? The color expert that I am, I said, that's it right there, right? Actually, well, I kind of bracketed it so we'd have some, some uh, leeway on either side. But no, I think you're right. I think you're right. You know, and the thing is, when I uh, put these on the beadboard, it's just because I had beadboard lying around. I used it for material. I actually kind of like the look of that, that kind of the stripe, the texture back there. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking instead of painting the back of the bookcase, Maybe what I'll do is I'll just cut panels out of that and paint the panels and just put them in there, just tack them in. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Yeah. With the color selection made, I get to work painting the beadboard, which I've cut to size. To attach the panels, I'm using just a few small brads, nailing mostly around the edges. This way, I have fewer nail holes to fill and an easier time removing the panels if later on I want to go for a different look. I really like the way this looks. It's added a nice accent to the room, and I'm really glad I did the color samples because I think we picked a really good one here. And you know what? If I get tired of this, I can just pop those panels up. Installing a programmable thermostat can cut your energy costs by up to 33%. It's easy to do with a few simple steps. First, remove the decorative cover or trim piece from the existing thermostat. Underneath, you'll find mounting screws. Remove these and the thermostat mechanism. Most thermostats have four or five wires connected to terminals that are labeled. Next, remove the mounting screws from the base and pull it away from the wall. One by one, disconnect the wires from the terminals. Pull them out and label them as you go. I made these labels with a computer printer and sprayed the back with contact cement. Now what's important here is to make sure the labels match the lettering on the terminals. They have nothing to do with the wire colors. Place the new base in position on the wall and mark the location of the mounting holes. Drill the holes, insert plastic anchors, tap them into place, and mount the base plate. This thermostat has a printed wiring diagram. Remember those labels? Well, all you have to do now is attach the wires to the corresponding terminals. No guesswork, no trial and error. 
Finally, snap on the cover and you're finished. For a sleeker look, consider this flush mounted thermostat. To install it, trace the inside of this template that's included with the thermostat. Cut out the marked opening using a wallboard saw and set the recessed housing in place. As you begin tightening the screws on the front of the housing, these wings flip out on the back side of the wall. Continued tightening pulls the wings snugly against the surface, holding the box securely in place. Then connect the labeled wires to the corresponding terminals, slip the thermostat into the housing, and snap it in place. Rather than protruding, this recessed model sits nearly flush with the surrounding wall. Greater comfort, lower energy bills, that's a lot of benefit in such a small package. Now some say you can never have too many clamps, and I guess if you look around my shop you'd say I'm living proof of that. But despite the fact that I've got dozens of these, sometimes I still don't have just the right one. That's when it's time to do some creative clamping. Now here's a good example. Let's say I have a piece of loose veneer right in the center of a panel like this. Now even these clamps won't come close to reaching that point. So here's a solution. I take a small block of wood, place it right on the loose veneer. On top of that, I put a strip of wood that's long enough to reach to the edge of the panels. Then I drop one clamp over here, and a second over here. And as I tighten this up, I'm applying pressure exactly where I want it. Example two. Let's say that I want to clamp these two boards together, but the biggest clamp I've got is not long enough to reach across them. Well, here's the solution. Take the first clamp, lay it on the board, take a second clamp, and interlock it with the first. Now, what I've done is turn two short clamps into one longer one. Now, sometimes one of the most challenging clamping jobs is holding something vertical while you work on it. Well, here's one thing that works pretty well. Take a sliding C-clamp like this and clamp it near the bottom on both ends. Then, clamp the clamps to the tabletop or workbench. Now, both my hands are free, so I can go ahead and work. Did you know you can create a clamp from just about any board by cutting it on the diagonal and screwing it down to a base? Now, here's how it works. Let's say I want to clamp this board. I slide this piece in, give it a tap on this end. This is held securely in place. If I want to take it out, just tap on this end. Now, if you don't have all these clamps, or even if you do, sometimes you've got to get creative with your clamping. Now these are the levels that I use most, a two-footer and a four-footer. The two-footer for inside window frames, the four-footer for door jams. Now wouldn't it be interesting if they could combine these two levels into one? Well, this company has. This is from Straightaway. In this stage, it's a two-foot level. Pull out the ends, and it becomes a four-foot level. And if this isn't long enough for you, you can take their four-foot level, pull out the ends on that, and it becomes a six or even an eight-foot level. To view today's projects again, visit ronhazelton.com. Step-by-step home improvement tips when you need them. Let Ron show you how to do it yourself.